road course was quite a mess to say the least and after its race in 2023 next year should we reconsider the oval or should we stick with the road course in other words should we go back to the basics at indy this episode of above feel aligned is presented by haymaker coffee if you work hard, run hard, fight hard, and play hard, Haymaker Coffee has the coffee for you. Make sure to use the promo code RACE10 to get 10% off your order of Haymaker Coffee. Hey, Race fans, it's Taylor, and welcome back to Above the Yellow Line, where we talk all about the NASCAR Cup Series. We gotta talk about the Indy Road Course, because granted, it was better than last year. Last year, the track was just not ready for these cars. This year, the drivers were not ready for this track. We'll talk all about that, your opinions. Should we go back to the basics, going back to the Indy Oval? But first, let's talk about your winner of the Verizon 200. As I hinted at, there was a lot of driver error on Sunday, but there was one driver that just decided to race maturely, more maturely than the rest of the field. Tyler Reddick racing from the pole and leading 38 laps was your winner of the Verizon 200. This is Tyler Reddick's second Cup Series career win, and the first one came at Road America, another road course win for Tyler Reddick. So could he be the new road course favorite? Too soon to tell, but clearly he's been able to defeat the road courses more than anybody else this season so far. So congrats to that team and Tyler Reddick. Going down the rest of your top 10, in second place was Austin Sindrick, and we actually saw a 2-3-4 rookie finish, and a lot of people say it was just luck. Granted, yes, there's luck in a lot of these finishes of the races, but considering that they had themselves in the right position at the right time when everybody else decided to just drive like crap, I would say those finishes were impressive. So for Austin Sindrick, after two rough weeks at New Hampshire Motor Speedway in Pocono, Sindrick jumps back into the top 10. Then for Harrison Burton and Todd Gilliland, this is their best career finishes in the Cup Series. Then in fifth place, we have Bubba Wallace. This is his third top five of the season. And also, if you look at his stats at road courses, we all know they're not great. This season, his best finish was 35th at Road America. And previous to that, he has never had a top 10 in one of his road course starts. Today, he has a top five. So a really good day for Bubba Wallace, getting much needed points and actually advances his standings on the playoff grid. We'll talk about points in a little bit. Then in sixth, we have Joey Logano, and he's actually finished outside the top 20 since Nashville, if you can believe it or not. So it's really good to see that 22 team back in the top 10 where they belong. It's just been a really big struggle, I think, for four of these past few weeks. Then in seventh place, we had AJ Allmendinger, and if you stuck around near the end of the race, you saw that he basically collapsed as he got out of his car. There's a lot of heat exhaustion involved. He had no water in the last stage of the race, and he also had the, the cooling gear that he was wearing was not working. So mass respect to AJ Allmendinger. I hope he's feeling better today, but it was really scary to see. And also, I don't think we actually got an update after we saw him collapse on air, just because after that, they had to go to their regularly scheduled programming. But I hope, like I said, he's doing better today. Then in eighth place, we have Michael McDowell. This is his ninth top 10 of the season, which is another career best. We keep adding on to those stats for Michael McDowell. However, announced after the Pocono race, his team was docked some major points with an L2 penalty because according to NASCAR, the team modified a single source supplied part. McDowell was docked 100 driver points, 10 playoff points, and the team was docked 100 owner points and 10 owner championship playoff points. Crew Chief Blake Harris was fined $100,000 and suspended for the next four races. One of those races was served at the Indy Road Course, so he has three races to go. Not good for that team, especially as I thought they probably could have won their way into the playoffs considering we still have Daytona left, but not a good look for the number 34 team. In ninth, we have Cole Custer with his second top 10 of the season, and then in 10th place, most impressively, in my opinion, we have Chris Busher, who actually had his car catch on fire on pit road, and then he got two laps down, then he was able to get back into the top 10 at the end of the race. Chaos considering that might have helped him, but otherwise a very impressive run for Chris Busher, all things considered. Now looking outside the top 10 in the 11th position, this is notable because he still is without a contract. Kyle Busch, a notable stat that I found on NASCAR Reddit is that in the last seven races, he has finished outside the top 10, which is the worst stretch of his career. Really not good for that 18 team. I don't know what's going to get him back into the top 10. All things considered, Michigan, maybe, maybe not, but it, it, otherwise it's a pretty significant stat to note as he is still without a contract. Next up in the 17th position with his second top 20 of his career, also in his second start in the Cup Series, Ty Gibbs, a really good run for him. And then in the 27th position, something we're going to have to talk about a little bit is Ross Chastain. 
During the overtime restart, Ross Chastain was going into turn one, missed it, and then ended up using the access road to get back on the track, hoping to keep his position. The key thing to note here is that NASCAR never said that that would induce a penalty going on the access road, keeping your position, or just to get back on the track would not be a penalty. Well, upon further review, NASCAR said that it was. Personally, I don't like how this move was handled post-race with the post-race interview. I thought it was kind of done unproffessionally and disrespectfully. I was talking to the guys in the above field line group chat about it, but I will say the one thing that I solidifyingly do not like, if that is a word, is that it was a discrepancy call. NASCAR didn't specifically say, hey, before the race, you cannot do this, and whether this was pre-planned or not by Ross Chastain, which personally I don't think it was. I don't think Ross Chastain and his team before the race was like, hey, by the way, on the last lap, we're going to go through this access road to win and NASCAR can't do anything about it. I think if anyone believes that, I think that's totally false. I think it's kind of bizarre and out there. But I think what's crazy about this is NASCAR d didn't even think that this could have been an option for drivers. Of course, if we're going to see an incident on track like this, it's going to be for something that NASCAR didn't specifically lay out ahead of time. It, it, it's just how it always works. So that's my only thing with this incident that I wish NASCAR would have laid down the rule first instead of making a call afterwards. And imagine if Ross Chastain would have won the race, we would have had another disqualification on our hands. And I, I don't know necessarily, you're going to have to fact check me on this, if Ross Chastain was relayed over the radio that, hey, that wasn't allowed and that's why he backed off, or if Tyler Reddick really was just able to overtake him during that time. But um, just imagining what could have been and the mess that could have been, and I, I think that would have added to other people's negative perception of this race. If you had a negative perception of this race, if Ross Chastain was disqualified, it would have kind of put the nail in the coffin for the Indy Road course. Now let's take a look at the points, starting with the above the line points. Adam has a huge lead over the rest of us because he picked the race winner yet again. Tyler Reddick was his race pick. He now has 63 points. I am in second with a pick of Christopher Bell, which could have worked out, but I now have 58 points. Dom had a pick of Kyle Busch, has 53 points. And Brandon, with a pick of Austin Cindric, who finished in second, now has 51 points. Looking at the playoff grid after this race, not a lot of things changed, but we will point out the things that did. Tyler Reddick boosted his playoff standings to the fifth position in the playoff grid. And Ryan Blaney actually expanded his lead from 22 points last week to 25 points to Truex. Kevin Harvick is minus 96 to the good. And a big note here, Bubba Wallace was able to move himself from the 22nd position in the playoff grid to the 20th position in the playoff grid based on his fifth place finish this weekend at Indy. But well, that's an update on your points. Now it's time to take a look at our Zyloware MVP of the week. We have to start, though, on a negative note with our LVP. And for me, it's no contest. The LVP is Kyle Larson. First off, it was his birthday. Bad birthday to not finish the race in. And knowing that he's really good at road courses and after the finish that he had, he just he wasn't present at all during the race. He wasn't really a contender. And then he ended up wrecking with Ty Dillon. And I say wrecking with Ty Dillon because he lost his brakes. Ran into Ty, it was a huge hit, one of the biggest hits I think I've seen all season, and not good for Kyle Larson, somebody that we would expect to do well at the Indy Road course, so that is why he is the LVP of the week. Then for the MVP, I chose Tyler Reddick, one, because he won the race, and two, he was more mature than the rest of the field out there. Again, from the TV, I don't know if he actually spun during the race or not, but I'm going to say from my view, I don't think I saw him spin at all. He dominated the race, led the most laps, so Tyler Reddick and that eight team, you are this week's Xyloware MVP. Now let's go down the line talking about key moments of the weekend, and that would have to be the debate between the oval or the road course. I asked you all on Twitter what you thought would be best, and what you had to say is 60% of you said bring back the oval, 39.1% of you said keep the road course. Of course, I want to read your comments. The Big One Podcast argued that we should keep both road course and oval plus IRP. Run oval one weekend with trucks at IRP and Xfinity on oval. Short format IRP, 250 miles or so. On a short track, Wednesday night, shootout, cup only. Then Indy Road Course for cup and Xfinity the weekend after. Three races in a week is tough, but not impossible. Justin said, what's going to sell more seats? I think it's kind of cool seeing Indy cars and NASCAR on the same weekend too. More crossovers would be great, I would agree. And then there was a lot of comments saying scrap them both and go to IRP. So a lot of you in the comments brought up the IRP race, and I wasn't able to see all of it, but from what I saw and the highlights that I was able to watch, it was actually really good. I don't know why we left in the first place, but I would like to see the Gen 7 cars race there at some point. Now, I do not believe that we should replace Indy completely. I think that's a huge mistake. Granted that this track used to be a crown jewel race, we cannot replace Indy on the schedule. However, maybe having IRP in for another date would be a suggestion, but personally, I think we should go back to the Oval 
And I say that not because the track that we got for the road course, I think that NASCAR did a good job making the track better, the drivers not so much on this track, but the oval we have not seen the Gen 7 cars race on it yet, and from what we've seen this season so far, the Gen 7 car has elevated the racing that we've seen at a lot of tracks like that, so I think we should at least try the oval after we are done with our stint at the road course next year, and maybe we're not done with the stint at the road course, maybe we decide to keep it through 2024 and so forward. But my opinion is we got to try the oval again with these new cars. So that's my thought on the oval versus the road course debate. I'm, I'm a little more heated about it than I think I'm giving off and, and talking to you all. But let me know in the comments below what you think. But now it is time to rate this race above or below the yellow line. I asked you all on Twitter and on YouTube what you thought of this race. And here is what you had to say. From the poll on Twitter. 16.8% of you said this race was great, 32.7% said this race was good, 23.9% said okay, and 26.5% said bad. On YouTube, 33% of you said this race was great, 19% said good and okay, and 29% of you said this race was bad. As for your specific comments, Rob, one of the above the yellow line crew, said this was a circus, and Kyle said correct, yeah, definitely was. Sean said, man, the driver's behavior was just so sad, pathetic, no respect racing, track is fine. But yay, Tyler. Era said could have been better. Turn one was actually always complete chaos. The moves from some teams in stage one and two could have been interesting at the end of the race. Unfortunately, the race has lost the complete flow with all the cautions and accidents and whatnot. Finally, Adam Lucas said, wild but not wonderful Indianapolis. A few years ago, I was one of those people championing for a switch to the road course. I am sad to say that I was wrong and regret this belief in change. After watching this race, I want to see the Cup Series run on the oval again. Road course racing this season has been very bland, minus a few late race moments. But even those moments cannot paint a happy picture to the overall product. Reddick had by far the strongest car all weekend and escaped all the final laps of carnage and confusion unscathed. Other than that, I enjoyed seeing Blaney go on an alternate strategy to get ahead of Bell and truly stretching his tires. I hate saying this, but I'd rather be bored watching the oval instead of screaming at a theatrical mess on the road course. Today's race gets a 46 out of 100 below the yellow line. Again, thank you all so much for commenting on those post-race polls. It helps me get a gauge of what you all thought of the race, if I'm kind of out of touch or not. And for this one, I would say I don't think I was. I personally was not a fan of this race. And as I hinted at earlier, it was not because of the track. It was because of the drivers. I didn't realize that we were bumper cart racing this weekend. It just, it, there, I, I don't know why. I think there was just some urgency with the playoffs. And I think that might have added to the hysteria around what we saw this weekend racing wise but even then I mean I didn't feel like there was a lot of passing and that, that kind of frustrated me too but I don't know it was just it was chaotic but in a bad way and for that reason I have to give this race a rating below the yellow line I gotta give it a 45 percent if we want to bring some positivity into that rating though I do have constructive feedback and it has to do with giving these drivers more practice I think if they had more practice this weekend we might have seen a better result but at the same time, I also know that the track temperatures changed from when they did practice and when they did qualifying to what we saw on Sunday. So that was also an issue. So maybe, if possible, have practice the morning of the race. I know the track temperatures are going to be cooler in the morning than they will be in the afternoon, but that'll still give the crew chiefs and the team some sort of sense of what's going to be happening race day on the track. So that's constructive feedback there, but I will say some positivity as to why my race rating was a 45% that at least boosted it a little bit was that the race length was actually pretty good. I liked the 200 miles. I, th I thought it was pretty decent. So all things considered, 45%, not the best, but it could also be worse. All that said and done, now it's time to preview the Firekeepers Casino 400 at Michigan International Speedway, starting with your track facts and driver stats. The track length at Michigan is 2 miles, and the race length is 200 laps and 400 miles long. Stage 1 is 45 laps, stage 2 is 75 laps, and the final stage is 80 laps. Now for your driver stats, the last driver to win at Michigan was Ryan Blaney. The active driver with the most track wins is Kevin Harvick with five. The active driver with the best average at the track is Chase Elliott with an average finishing position of 7.7. .7. Now for the team with the most track wins, we've had a Hendrick wash out the past few weeks. This week at Michigan International Speedway, it is RFK with the most wins with 13 wins in their history. And finally, the wins by manufacturer. Chevrolet has 26, Ford has 42, and Toyota has nine. All of this information from driveraverages.com. Let's close out this episode with our two watch to worry for Michigan. I gotta say, one guy I'm gonna be worried about is Kevin Harvick. Now, I know he's the winningest driver at this track, but he's had a few rough weeks. Granted, I know there was some beef with Alex Bowman at the Indy Road Course, which caused him to DNF. He 
got into it with Alex Bowman and wrecked out. And then when we had Pocono, he also got into an issue, not not his own fault, but he got into the Ross Chastain and Denny Hamlin issue. Like I said, not his fault. He was in the wrong place at the wrong time. But I believe that bad momentum brings more bad momentum. There's obviously a time where you turn it around and I'm hoping Michigan is that place for him. I'm also really concerned because he is behind the cutoff line by quite a bit. So that's why I'm going to be worried about Kevin Harvick this weekend. I'm also going to be worried about Brad Keselowski. This is a Ford heavy weekend. This is Ford's domain. This is their track. And part of me is concerned for Brad because RFK is the winningest team at this track and he's not had the best few weeks. I know he's turned it around a little bit, but he was spinning like out of control at the Indy Road Course. Granted, this is not a road course. This is an oval. We're back on the oval tracks, but I don't see Brad doing well. And I really want him to because he has to win to get his way into the playoffs. I don't see that happening either, but if he has a really good chance to do it, it's at this track and it's at Daytona. So I'm going to be concerned that they're not going to turn it around in time for this weekend, but we will just have to see. A driver I'm going to be watching, again, an RFK driver, I'm going to be watching Chris Buescher for giving one heck of a drive at Indy. It shows that he is determined to get a win or at least a good finish to get himself into the playoffs. So I'm going to be watching Chris Buescher to see if he can win and get in. And then the final driver I'm going to be watching was last year's winner, which is Ryan Blaney. He had a really gutsy call at Indy. He decided not to get tires. In my opinion, that was a little bit of a mistake, but it got him back track position and time to the leaders. So, I mean, their team is really trying to get Ryan Blaney the win here. I think points racing, their days of trying to points race their way into the playoffs is done because it is too much of a risk. I feel like Michigan is their best chance to get a win. Again, he's also very, very good at the super speedways. So Daytona is another place where Ryan Blaney can get a win. And I think I actually predicted that he would get a win at Atlanta. That didn't happen. I'm going to place my bets on Michigan this weekend. I'll be at the track, so I'm hoping we see a Ryan Blaney win. If not, that's going to suck, but I'm going to be watching Ryan Blaney to see how well he does at Michigan this weekend. Who are your two watch to worry for the Firekeepers Casino 400? Let me know in the comments below. And with that, we are done with this episode of Above the Low Line, the show where we talk all about the NASCAR Cup Series. I'm excited to be traveling to Michigan this weekend, my first time ever at that facility. Very excited to see some more racing this season in person, and I'm excited to give you an at-track perspective of everything that went on. So to keep up with all of that, make sure to follow our social media pages at underscore Taylor Kitchen underscore on Twitter for post-race polls and daily questions, and Above the Low Line on Instagram, YouTube, and wherever you get your podcasts. Also, make sure to check out TobyChristy.com on all social media platforms to find great motorsports content and TobyChristy.com to hear and read more from the team and your favorite drivers. Last but not least, I want to thank Xyloware and Haymaker Coffee for supporting Above the Yellow Line and TobyChristy.com. You can find all of our social media pages linked in the description below, but before you check those out, make sure to like this video, subscribe to the channel, share this with your friends and family, and guys, thank you so much for supporting us here at Above the Yellow Line and TobyChristy.com, and until next time, I'll see ya.